have got a special announcement as we begin. I am not Pastor Kenny. <laughs> so I miss him. Uh, he's not here today. Brother Joe's not here. Brother Rob is baptizing. Brother Mike is recovering. And so I'm not, I'm not the bottom of the barrel. I'm not even in their barrel. So thank you for giving me this privilege. There is a city on earth that is the single most important city in the world. I can say that because it's the only city that we're commanded to pray for. As this city goes, so goes the rest of the world. This city is Jerusalem. Not Washington, not Wilmington or Waynesville, it's Jerusalem. I call it the epicenter of the world. If you want to know what's happening in the world, keep your eyes on Jerusalem. As Jerusalem goes, so goes the world. These are important days. And the single most important event that's happening is not happening in Washington or even at the ballot box. It's important, as important as that is. The most important thing that's happening in the world is happening in Jerusalem. So I want you to take your Bibles. We're going to look at several verses, but we're going to stay mainly in one book. Hey, it's of the 39 books in the Old Testament, it's the 38th. So find the book of Malachi. And if you're in the Malachi, you're too far. Go back one book. And it's the book of Zechariah. Turn with me to the book of Zechariah. You do have a Bible, uh, either in print or on your phone or on the tablet. It's going to be very important. What important is not what I say, but what the Word of God says. The most important city, I can say that with that equivocation because the Scriptures mentions it more than any other city. When the ancient uh, cartographers would make maps, they wouldn't put the center of their map, Rome or Paris. They would put the center of their map, Jerusalem. You know why? Because Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 5, thus says the Lord God, this is Jerusalem, and I have set her in the midst of the nations all about her. In the midst of the nations means she's the center. Jerusalem is the geographical center of the world. Three major continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa, all hinge on Jerusalem. It's the prophetic center of the world. <clears throat> Did you know that 95% of this book was written in Israel? In fact, of the 66 books of the Bible, all of them except for Revelation was written in Israel. It's the prophetic center. It is the spiritual center of the world. Jerusalem is the only city in the world whose history and future has been minutely, accurately recorded in the Word of God. Everything that the Lord said would happen to Jerusalem happened. Therefore, everything that He said will still happen in Jerusalem, I promise you, on the authority of the Word of God, it's going to happen. So it's a great Scripture to help us remember the faithfulness of God. Here's the whole crux of the message this morning, in case you have to leave early. Here it is. The same God who had a purpose and a plan that's irrevocable, unreplaceable, that same God who had a purpose and a plan for Jerusalem, that same God has a purpose and a plan for you. And for you and for each one of us, it is also irrevocable and irreplaceable. I've met those in recent years who've said, well, no, wait a minute. Uh, the promise God made to Israel has been broken because Israel was unfaithful to God. Therefore, because of their unfaithfulness, he has not kept his promise. God has not kept his promise. No, God's broken his covenant and has replaced Israel with the church. He's replaced the Jews with Christians. And there's only one problem with that. It ain't so. That's not so. Listen, when God makes a promise, he keeps his promise. It's irrevocable. It's irreplaceable. If I cannot trust God to keep his promise, 
he made to the Jews 4,000 years ago, how can I trust him to keep his promise he made to us 2,000 years ago? God is a God who keeps his word. And for those of you that says, no, no, Jerusalem, that's not his favorite city. He doesn't have favorites. God treats all cities alike. And you don't know your scriptures, beloved. If you're taking notes, and I hope you are, just check it out yourself. Psalm 87, verse 1, says his foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. That's it. That's it. Who owns Jerusalem? That's the question. That's the conflict right now in the world. That's the question World War III will start over. Whose city is Jerusalem? The Muslims say, well, it's our city. We ought to be there. We ought to have at least half of it, not all of it. Israel says it's our city. Whose city is it? Psalm 87 says whose city it is. It's the city of God. And as God, he has a right to give it to whomever he wants to. And he doesn't need our permission. In fact, we don't even get to vote on it. God said, it's my city. I have chosen to give it to the Jews as my habitation. Where is that? It's in Psalm 132, verse 13. The Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. This it's a wonderful city. Whose city is? It, it tickles me to hear these people protesting. Uh, by tickling, I, I mean, I'm, I'm amazed. These are coming, many of them from universities who claim to be the bastion of intelligence, and they are the bastions of ignorance. Because study your history. Study your history. Jerusalem was a city. 1,312 years before Christ, Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. Islam did not start until seven centuries after Christ. 2,000 years before Islam ever started, Jerusalem was the capital for the Jewish people. And number two, Jerusalem is mentioned 818 times in the word of God. You know how many times Jerusalem is mentioned in the Quran? Zero. Every king of Israel reigned from Jerusalem. From Saul and David and Solomon, every king of Israel always reigned from Jerusalem. Do you know how many Muslim entities, monarchs, rulers have ever reigned in Jerusalem? Zero. The question is very simple. If you just go by history, if you don't believe scriptures, going by history alone, you see that Jerusalem is the capital that God has ordained and a very special city. That's why David said in Psalm 122, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. The house of the Lord is Jerusalem because the next verse, verse two, verse two always follows verse one. And I believe that's true in every translation. And when he said, I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Verse two, our feet have been standing within your gates. Oh, Jerusalem. Verse three, Jerusalem is a city that is compact together. He's talking about Jerusalem. We were so glad. David said, as a Jewish boy growing up, I was glad when my family said, hey, it's time to go to Jerusalem. Because God's people always enjoy festivals. And God gave his people seven festivals. These are listed in Leviticus 23. Three of those were so important, they had to go to Jerusalem to celebrate. No matter where they were in the country, you got to pack up your stuff, go to Jerusalem, and celebrate this feast there. One is the feast of Passover. Number two is the feast of Pentecost. Number three is the feast of tabernacles, booths. Uh, they call it Sukkot. Very important festivals. I was glad when they told me, let's go to Jerusalem. Jesus went to Jerusalem at least three times a year, every year of his life. It was in Jerusalem where Abraham took his son Isaac to be offered on the altar. He never killed him, but God told him to take him to Mount Moriah. Well, I thought you said Jerusalem. Jerusalem is Mount Moriah. That's the same city where Jesus taught. 
It's the same city where Jesus was tried. Jerusalem is where Jesus was crucified. Jerusalem is where Jesus was buried. Jerusalem is where Jesus raised from the dead. Jerusalem is where Jesus ascended back to the Father. And I'm going to show you in scriptures that will be to Jerusalem, not to Washington or New York or not even Paris. It will be to Jerusalem that the Messiah himself will come back to play. The, this world thinks it's through with Jesus. Jesus is not through with this world. He's going to come back. And of all the places on earth, he's going to touch down in the city of Jerusalem. Very important. It's the only city that God ever cried over. Matthew chapter 23, the Bible says, when Jesus walked into Jerusalem, he looked over the city and the Bible says, he wept over Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I want to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Oh, Jerusalem. It's the single most important city. You better know what God's plan for Jerusalem is. That's going to help you have stability and security and faith in these days to come. As terrible as things are now, they're going to look much worse in the days to come. And that shouldn't discourage us. Jesus said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, lift up your heads because your redemption draws nigh. It ought to be encouraging. Adrian Rogers used to say, things are looking gloriously dark. And he's right. That's the way Christians ought to be living their life. Jerusalem is the, the epicenter of man's hopes. It's the center of God's promises. That's why God loves it. That's why Satan hates it. Holy Spirit was poured upon it. The church was sent out from it. Jesus wept over it. The nations are being drawn to it. And one day, the Messiah is going to come back to that same city again. I want you to understand God's plan for Israel and especially this city of Jerusalem because that will encourage you. The same God who cares for Jerusalem cares for me. So I want you to notice several truths. Write these down. Get a pencil or paper or mascara, anything. Write these down in the next few minutes. Here's truth number one. I want you to see in the book of Zechariah. And we're about to start there. Zechariah chapter one. We'll start with the continuity of Jerusalem. I call it the continuity because no other city on earth has faced such awful devastation and destruction like Jerusalem has. It's been besieged and surrounded at least 22 times. It's had 56 wars in this city. 17 times Jerusalem has been totally demolished. It's its hills have been flattened. Its valleys have been filled with waste and human bodies and rubble of buildings that's been burned. Two times totally devastated and demolished, wiped away completely, and the inhabitants killed or taken as captives. You'd say a city like that would never come back together again. Oh, no, no. Remember, God said, this is my city. I've chosen it, and Jerusalem is going to last as long as God lasts. It's exactly what Zechariah says. Zechariah is talking about the promises of God. Uh, now understand, he was a prophet that prophesied after the time of the exile. The people of God, because of their disobedience to God, have been punished. And God said, if you turn against me, I will turn against you and scatter you among the nations. So there they were. The Babylonians took them into captivity. The Babylonians have been taken over by the Persians. And here they are now, 70 years later. Their capital destroyed. Their nation doesn't exist anymore. It was once one nation under God. And God said, because you turn your back on me, I'm going to punish you and scatter you among the nations. And now they are. And here's a prophet who's brokenhearted and he's living among a people that's brokenhearted and as he weeps, he says, oh, God, have you forgotten your promise to Jerusalem? And that's where it picks up. It's so much like our day. Could a nation be one nation under God? And God yet let that nation be punished? Would God let one nation under God be dissolved by pagan foreign powers? 
He did to Israel. And so listen to the words of Zechariah in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 12. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O oh, Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which you were angry these 70 years? And the Lord answered, and angels talked to me with good and comforting words. The angel who spoke with me said to me, proclaim saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Jerusalem, for Zion with great zeal. I'm exceedingly angry with the nations at ease, for I was a little angry and they helped, but with evil intent. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, says the Lord of hosts, and a surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Again, proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, my city shall again spread out throughout prosperity. The Lord will again comfort Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. Hey, folks, things look terrible right now. But God always keeps his promise. In fact, God chose a prophet by the name of Zechariah, which means the Lord remembers to deliver this message to his family. God never forgets. God never forgets. He gave you a promise. He's going to continue to exist. And here they are, surrounded with rubble. But God says, Jerusalem shall once again be inhabited. And he says it for these next several chapters over and over. <clears throat> Jerusalem will be rebuilt and will become a strong city. Even though it's been devastated. In chapter 2, this is not on the screen, so you'll have to look at it in your scriptures. Zechariah 2 verse 8, he says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. You want to get God's attention? Stick your finger in his eye. That's what Gaza did. That's what Egypt did. That's what Germany did. You want the full wrath of God to come against you, then touch the apple of his eye, which is Israel, Jerusalem. Every nation, history's records are replete with the ash pile of nations that were once great, mighty empires and are today nothing for one reason. They stuck their finger in God's eye. They stood against God's people. Woe to that nation that comes against the people of God called Israel. This is what the scripture says. And then skip over to Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous. There's that word again. That word zealous is the same word for uh, fire or red. God, it, God doesn't have a face. And yet the scriptures uses words, terms, human terms to try to describe like God like his face. His face turning towards us it, it is his favor. Zealous is when God's face turns red. He is so excited, so uh, enthralled with this place. I am zealous, he says in verse 2, for Zion with great zeal and with great fervor I'm zealous for. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called. It's not called that today, but it shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each one with his staff in his hand because of great age. Hey, time out. When this preacher first delivers this message, he's writing out word for word everything that God tells him. And now can you imagine standing in a group of, can you imagine standing in a group of uh, people in uh, Hiroshima and saying, I know everything's smoldering right now. But this city is going to be bigger and better than ever before. Who's going to believe that? And here's a man standing in the rubble of Jerusalem saying, believe it or not, 
this city one day is going to be the city of God and God is going to dwell there. He's zealous over this city. And there'll come a time when old men and women will come downtown at the city park and sit on the bench and lean over their, their walking canes and look at the children playing. He talks about the children in the next verse, verse 5. The streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. One of the things I love to do down in the old city of Jerusalem when we go there, and there's a, a couple of dozen of us going there in uh, four weeks, by the way. When we go downtown Jerusalem and see all the boys and girls playing and the old men and women sitting there watching them, it's a, it's a fulfillment of the book of Zechariah. Now, let me tell you, that could have never happened until our day. 200 years ago, unheard of. 150 years ago, people laughed at it. 586 BC, Jerusalem was destroyed. Then in 70 AD, the Romans destroyed it for the last time, never to be rebuilt again. They thought, carried away all the people, scattered them to the four corners of the earth. So for 25 centuries, liberals, I know they hate that name. They like to call themselves progressives. <laughs> They're not progressive. They're liberal. Liberals for 25 centuries have laughed at that scripture and said, bah, bless his heart. Of course, Zechariah is an allegory. It's a metaphor. It's, you can't take it literal. Uh, Jerusalem is done for forever. But on May 14th, 1948, they quit laughing. Because for the first time in human history, a nation that had been destroyed was reconstitution, reconstituted as the same nation under the same name, using the same language. They're the only nation on earth that today speaks the same language they did 4,000 years ago. Tell me another nation like that. May 14th, May 15th, 1948, five Muslim Arab nations surrounding them declared war against Israel. We're going to stop them. They cannot be a nation. And so they were attacked by these other nations. It's miraculous to see all that went on during that time because these nations said, we're going to wipe you out. And so United States and the other places in the world would look on and say, oh, poor Israel. Uh, they may not last a day. And then after they lasted that day, they said, well, they may not last a week. And then when they went through that week, in a couple of months, this will be over. One year later, when those five nations surrendered because Israel had not only won, but Israel had taken more ground than they even had before. Then at the end of that time, the United States and the United Nations joined in telling Israel, you, you've got to have peace. You've got to have peace. And the only way to have peace is you've got to stop the war. We call for an immediate ceasefire. Hmm, where have I heard that before? We're calling for an immediate ceasefire and give land for peace. Give back some land so you can have peace with your enemies. Land for peace, does that work? Hey, uh, ask the Lumbee. Ask the Cherokee. Land for peace. So Israel, under pressure from this nation and many others, gave away the Golan Heights gave away the west side or the east side of the Jordan River and gave away the east side of Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was divided. The first part was for the, the eastern part was for the Jewish people and the western part would be uh, for the Arab people. That's, that's what was happening. All because they didn't understand the scriptures, what the scripture says about this land. Do you know why Israel is so hated? Why is Jerusalem so hated by those who don't know God? Write down 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 6. God said, I have chosen Jerusalem so that my name may they be there together. It's not about America. It's not about the United States or the United Nations. It's about the name of Jesus. God said, I've chosen this city so my name will be there. Jerusalem, you see the name of Jesus in it. That's why they hate it so much. Now, here's what that means to you and I in Wilmington, North Carolina in 2024. If God 
can protect Jerusalem with all the hatred against it, God can protect you. If God can keep Jerusalem safe, he can keep you safe. God keeps his promises and you can trust him. Write down Psalm 125 verse 1. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. Dear brother and sister, if you've given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, your salvation is eternally secure, and it doesn't depend upon you. These people who believe that Israel has been replaced, I say why would God replace them? Why would God break his word to them? Because they were unfaithful. Do you mean, are you telling me that once a person becomes unfaithful, God says, that's it, I'm through with you. If that's true, none of us are gonna make it to heaven. I wouldn't trust the best 10 minutes of my life. I wouldn't trust the time I'm asleep to get me to heaven. I'm trusting in grace alone through faith in Jesus alone to get me to heaven. <laughs> the same grace that saves us is the same grace that secures us. As the Lord surrounds Jerusalem, he surrounds you, the Bible says. So there's the continuity of Jerusalem. I wish we could stop there and say, and they lived happily ever after, but that's not happening, is it? So number two, there's the conflict over Jerusalem. I could call it the conspiracy over Jerusalem because let's just skip over to the last of this book, Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12. The whole world is going to center its eyes on Jerusalem. That little piece of land called Israel, about the size of New Jersey. Saudi Arabia is 113 times the size of Israel. There are 42 Muslim nations on earth. There's one Jewish nation. And those other 40 plus Muslim nations do not want that one little nation to exist. That's the crux of the Middle Eastern problem. And we know that true is because the word of God told us this. Zechariah 12 verse 2. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. I'm telling you, we're living in that time right now. Zechariah is not talking about his day. That's why the phrase that's used 17 times in these last three chapters, in that day, in that day, not talking about his day, not talking about the day of the Lord Jesus on earth, but he's talking about in the last days, there's going to come a time when God is going to cause all the nations to conspire against Jerusalem. He uses two phrases, two pictures. Jerusalem will be like a cup of drunkenness. It's the picture of a, of a drunkard that because he's intoxicated, he stammers and he stutters and he stumbles. Why? Because he's, he's overwhelmed. He's obsessed with alcohol. There'll be enemies of Israel in the last days that will be so obsessed, so intoxicated with their hatred for the Jewish people that they'll stumble and they'll do all kinds of crazy things. That's the day we're living in right now. Jerusalem is a cup of drunkenness. Number two, it's also a stone that they're trying to get rid of, but yet the stone keeps coming back on them. It's a burden to them. God said, that's going to happen in these last days. And it's going to be inhabited mainly, even though it's a city for my people, Gentiles will inhabit it. Now remember, Jerusalem, half of it was given to the Muslims in 1949 for peace. So there for 25 centuries, Israel was not a nation. It became a nation, all except one city, the single most important city, was still being trampled by Gentiles. 
Now, why is that phrase important? Because it's twice in the word of God. Once is when Jesus said it. In Luke chapter 21, 24, Jesus said, they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led away captives into all the nations and Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. It's a Jewish city, but it's going to be trampled by Gentiles. And so it was until June 8th, 1967. In June the 2nd, 1967, those same Muslim nations attacked Israel and Israel counterattacked and there was a war for six days. It's no, I'm not being funny, but it's literally called the Six Day War. And it was stopped in June 8th, 1967, when America and the United Nations told Israel, stop, stop, uh, cease fire, and you can have this land. They took back the Golan Heights, they took back the eastern side of Jordan, and they took back all of Jerusalem. So when Jesus said, these things are going to happen until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, that happened in June 8th, 1967. Everybody here that's been born since June 8th, 1967, this has been fulfilled in your lifetime. You are the generation to see what no generation has seen for 25 centuries. That's exciting to me because the Bible said this is going to happen in all the conflict over Jerusalem. And you'd say, well, that's the end of the story. It gets worse. Zechariah says public opinion is going to turn against Israel. What? These mean Jewish people. They own all the banks. They own all the silver and gold. They're the ones causing the world problem. They're murdering little innocent boys and girls. They're killing whole families. These people must be stopped. And CNN, the Cursing News Network, and these other medias will all turn against Israel. And they will turn public opinion against Israel. This is happening, and this was prophesied five centuries before Jesus was born. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 6. In that day, I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile, like a fiery torch in the sheaves. They'll devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left. But Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, Jerusalem, that only happened in your lifetime. The Lord will save the tents of Judah first so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall not become greater than that of Judah. In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day shall be like David. And the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. In that day, verse nine, there is gonna be a winner and it won't be nuclear warfare. It will not be the United Nations. It will not be the United States. Verse 9, it shall be in that day that I will. I will. That phrase is used seven times. I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Wait a minute, Michael. When he said all the nations... Do you think he meant United States? Nah, no, nah, I don't think that. I think that's an exception clause. I think that's in small print. The phrase all the nations in the original Hebrew, what it translates to is all the nations. <laughs> now, I love America. I love this nation that you and I live in. And it breaks my heart to see America turn its back on the one nation that keeps us alive. Jesus said, I'm going to fight. When the nations are coming against Israel and they're coming against them, I won't take time. Just jot down Psalm 83. It talks about a conspiracy of nations against Israel. Psalm 83. Read that on your own. And it mentions Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, Gaza. They stuck their finger in God's eye and God said, I'm going to wipe you out. And then the other nations will come and say, oh, look what these Jews are doing to our We've got to form a confederacy against them and the nations will come against them. But the winner will be Jesus Christ. Zechariah 14 verse 1. 
Behold, the day of the Lord is come. Are y'all still with me? And that's in 14, and there's only 14 chapters, so you know, surely we've got to be close soon. Zechariah 14, behold, the day of the Lord is coming and your spoil will be divided in your midst. I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken. The houses rifled, the women ravished. Half of the city will go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. This is in Revelation chapter 16, 16 and Revelation chapter 19 when he comes with this great cloud that's following him on white stallions. The Lord will go forth and fight against those enemies as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley, half of the mountain, will be toward the north and the other half will be toward the south. That's, that's exactly what the angel said. When Jesus ascended from Mount of Olives, two men stood by them in a wide apparel saying, you men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. And Zechariah says he's coming. And when he comes, he's going to end the war of to end all wars. And he will be the ultimate winner when he stands on the Mount of Olives. That's, that's the conflict over Jerusalem. And then number three is the conversion of Jerusalem. Because the issue is, what about the Jews? Paul asked the question to the Romans, has God forsaken the Jewish people? God forbid. Just because you and I who are Gentiles are being saved, it doesn't mean we've replaced the Jews. We have been engrafted into this Jewish vine. How will the Jewish people be saved? Romans chapter 11 verse 26 says, and all Israel will be saved. When will that be? It will be when they see Jesus face to face. Zechariah chapter 13, or chapter 12. Zechariah 12 verse 10. 12 10 says, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. Wait a minute. Two things, the spirit of grace and supplication. How's a person saved? We're only saved by grace through faith. And we're saved by grace through faith when we call upon him. That's what supplication means. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Jewish people on that day, how do I know it's Jewish people? He says in verse 10, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they've pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for his firstborn. He says the same thing in Revelation 1 verse 7. Behold, he's coming with clouds and every eye will see him and even they who pierced him. Who is that? The Jewish people. When Jesus Christ appears on the Mount of Olives, there he is. Whoa. That's... That's Yeshua, Yeshua HaMashiach. He's the one, he's the one we crucified and you really were our Messiah. Oh, please forgive me, please forgive me. And there'll be great mourning in that day when the Jewish people finally recognize the one they crucified was really their savior all alone. The conversion. Number four is the cleansing of Jerusalem. That's going to happen next because you've got blood everywhere. You've got millions of Jews who were killed. You've got millions of others from all the nations. There's blood everywhere on Jerusalem. So the Bible says in Zechariah 13 verse 1, In that day a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of, there's the city, Jerusalem. And this fountain is for two things, for sin and for uncleanness. The prophecy, there are more messianic prophecies in Zechariah than any other Old Testament book outside of Isaiah. And this is one of those. There's a fountain going to be opened up. The fountain is going to be for sin. Here's my question. What can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
But there's blood everywhere already. It's a prophecy of John chapter 19 that afternoon when they crucified our Savior. The Bible says in John 19 verse 34, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and blood and water came out. And the next time he comes to that same city, there'll be a great fountain opened up, first for the cleansing of sin. Oh, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though just as vile as he, wash all my sin away. A great fountain was opened up for sin and for uncleanness. Because for centuries, Muslim has been taking their dead bodies and burying them right outside the gates of Jerusalem. Because ha, ha, ha. When Messiah comes, if he really is a Jewish Messiah, he can't touch a dead bone or he becomes unclean. So there has to be something to happen to wash away all of that uncleanness. You know what's going to happen? Chapter 14, verse 8. In that day it shall be that living water shall flow from Jerusalem. Half of them toward the eastern sea, half of them toward the western sea. Both summer and winter, it was, oh, there's a great fountain going to open up underneath Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness, the cleansing of Jerusalem. I had so much to say. I know we're running out of time. If you only knew what I was not saying, you'd be so happy. <laughs> the last thing is this. The best is yet to come, the coronation of Jerusalem. Joy to the earth, joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. That didn't happen when he was born. That song has nothing to do with Christmas. It has everything to do with his next coming. Because Revelation, excuse me, Zechariah 14 verse 9 says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be the Lord is one and his name one. And then verse 11 the people shall dwell in it. No longer shall there be utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. Verse 16, it shall come to pass that everyone who's left of all the nations which come up against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. Oh, oh, Michael, I wish we were going with you to Jerusalem. I wish you were too, but hey, when Jesus comes back, if you're saved, we're all going to go there. And it's going to be some celebration when we see him crowned as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The last city ever mentioned in the Bible is the eternal city. Revelation chapter 21, verse 10. John said, He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Dear brother and sister, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you have to understand the urgency and the emergency of these days we're living in. If you've got friends or relatives that don't know Christ, please, if there's people that you go to school with or that you work with that don't yet know Christ, please, for Jesus' sake, if you're ever going to tell them, tell them now. Please tell them now. Please pray for them now. Well, how can I? I'm going to stand with Israel. You stand who where you want to. I know who wins. I know who's the last nation standing. So I'm going to stand with them. And there's two things I'm going to ask you to do if you want to support them. Number one is to pray for Israel. It's the only city we're commanded to pray for. Psalm 122 verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls prosperity within your palaces. You don't just pray for them, but stand up for them. If you as a child of God don't stand up for them, who's going to? The last verse, Psalm 137, verse five. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cleave to the room of the mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. I don't know anybody's heart, but God knows everybody's heart. And maybe you're here this morning and 
you, you believe in God here. You believe in the facts about him. And you've got a religion, but you don't follow him. You don't know him personally, please. There's a little guy in front of you on a Sunday morning on planet earth that's begging you to come and follow Jesus. The door of his grace is still open, but one day it will close. There's going to be counselors standing here at the front and on your way out, if the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart and you'd like for one of them to pray with you or to pray for you, if you'd like to give your life to Jesus and follow him, Come and talk to one of them right now. Let's stand to our feet. Let me pray with you. And you can start coming right now if you want to. Just our heads are bowed. You start coming. Counselors want to talk to you and pray with you. And Lord, thank you for giving us this warning. And thank you for giving us this encouragement. <laughs> you are a God who remembers. Oh, God, thank you. We don't have to be fearful or hysteric. You have a plan and a purpose. Thank you, Lord. Not just for Jerusalem, but for every man and woman and boy and girl that's here. Thank you. I pray that everyone will want to follow you. You deserve that, Lord. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen.